Samsung unveils its latest challenge to Apple, but will a bigger screen and a mobile payment system win over iPhone users? I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, King Digital warns that its third quarter may not crush it. Plus, Tinder's Twitter meltdown ends with a CEO swap, but will the leadership changes fix its PR nightmare? And Tesla comes up with a $500 million plan to make investors happy. All of that ahead on Bloomberg West. First to our lead, Samsung is doubling down on big screens, announcing two new phones today, the S6 Edge Plus and the Note 5. Both have a 5.7-inch display that's slightly bigger than the 5.5-inch screen on the iPhone 6 Plus, and they work with a new mobile payment system, Samsung Pay. Will these products, though, help Samsung take on Apple and rising Chinese competitors like Xiaomi and Lenovo? Strategy Analytics Executive Director Neil Malston, who covers smartphones, joins us via Skype from London. We've also got Visa's global head of innovation, Jim McCarthy. Visa is partnering with Samsung on its new mobile payments tool. And with me here in the studio is Canaan Partners Maha Ibrahim, who invests in several different mobile companies focused on gaming and e-commerce. Maha's going to be with me through the show. But Neil, I want to start with you. The Phones are almost identical, except the Edge has this wraparound screen. The Note has a pen. What stands out to you? Hey, good afternoon, folks. Yeah, the, the S6 Edge, I think, is, is quite a nice phone. What really kind of stands out on that is its wraparound screen. It's, it's effectively, if you like, in many ways, it's almost two screens in one phone. You've got a big screen on the front and then a smaller ticker screen down the side. And then for the Note device, what really stands out there is the S Pen device. So you can use that for certain functionality like writing directly onto PDFs in business use. So they're two, two very differentiated phones generally, I think. Big unveiling today at Samsung. We heard from the head of mobile, J.K. Shin. Take a listen to what he had to say. Bigger screens have gone from nice to have to must have. And a display, once called a gimmick, has now become the norm. Actually, that's Justin Dennison, head of mobile products. But, but Maha, you know, as he said, big screens are the new normal. So what sets these phones apart? Do you think people are going to buy these over the iPhone? Is this going to make people switch? The iPhone user is the iPhone user. Rarely does the iPhone user go back to Samsung or HTC or et cetera. Samsung is doing a great job in putting out fantastic products, but the market share they're gaining is what HTC, Motorola, et al. are losing. Samsung needs to care more about putting them to rest and to pasture and staving off people like Lenovo and Xiaomi as opposed to trying to take on Apple. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Samsung Pay because it is different from Apple Pay. And Jim, I'm so glad you're here. Visa has partnered with Samsung on this product. First of all, how is Samsung Pay different than Apple Pay? It's available in a lot more places. Yeah, so the, uh, while the, the, the user interface is very similar to what you would see on an Apple Pay device, the major difference is the fact that they, they bought a company called Lupe several months ago, and they've incorporated new technology in this phone that's unique to Samsung that allows this phone to be used contactlessly at, at virtually any terminal in the U.S. Uh, via the MagStripe reader. So... You know, what's interesting is Samsung isn't charging transaction fees for banks, isn't charging Visa, as I understand it, though Apple does. I mean, is this something that could lead to a renegotiation of Visa's deal with Apple over Apple Pay? Yeah, actually, I, I put it a little bit differently, Emily. Uh, what, what we introduced is a program that effectively says if someone wants to connect to Visa banks on the other side of us through our token service, which is the digital card number that goes on these devices, uh, that there are no fees uh, from Visa or the third parties. And so really we're taking a long view with Internet of Things on the horizon with lots of digital experiences built around commerce and payment. Uh, our view was is we've just got to uh, make it really simple from a contractual perspective for both parties, be it the banks as well as the uh, the, uh, the platforms that are providing these services. And so it's really something that we think is revolutionary with respect to driving the, the market forward. Still, it's a year after Apple Pay, Maha, but do you think Samsung Pay moves the needle? I think that Samsung et al. need to have applications, Sam, the, app, the Apple Pay or Samsung Pay is, an, is another example of that, that keeps people using the Samsung phone. This is Samsung's attempt to do that. 
At the end of the day, though, Samsung makes their money on the hardware. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's why they're able and willing to give away whatever margin and whatever revenue comes from a, a, a wallet. They make very little off of that and all their money and all their margin off the phone. Same with Apple. Right. So, Neil, looking out at the whole smartphone landscape and knowing that Samsung's global market share has been suffering, they've been not doing well in China in particular, where Apple and Xiaomi are now in the lead. You know, how well positioned is Samsung right now, given that the, the new iPhones we expect will be in, unveiled in just a few weeks, how well is Samsung positioned right now? Yeah, good, good question, Emily. So I think what's going to happen is Samsung is essentially trying to launch the S6 Edge Plus and uh, the Note right before the Apple iPhones come through in September, October. So Samsung's trying to time this before Apple. They're trying to get as many volumes in as they can before Apple comes, and it's really a timing issue for, for Samsung at this stage. On Neil, does it, does it matter the fact that they get a few weeks head start on Apple because they do this every year? Yeah, I mean, what Samsung has done essentially is they've accelerated the launch of this a little bit, I think. Typically, they tend to come towards the end of August, maybe into September, even some into October. So they've accelerated the launch of this a bit, and they're trying to get a, a jump on Apple, basically. So, Jim, I want to talk to you about the mobile payments landscape. You know, now we have Samsung Pay and Apple Pay and Android Pay. Android Wallet is, is, is coming. What, how optimistic are you about these different services, and what do you see about the different value propositions between them? Yeah, I, I'm actually very optimistic. I mean, for years we've been talking about the future of mobile payments and mobile commerce, and quite frankly, uh, the, the hype outweighed the reality. What, what's been great about the last several, uh, really the last year or so uh, since Apple Pay hatched is, we're seeing a convergence in terms of the way uh, these platforms, and they're all very large platforms, when you look at iOS and you look at Android and you look at Samsung as a hardware manufacturer, uh, they're all consistent with, with respect to the user interfaces, the way the cards work, um, the way they interact at the terminal, and the way they've integrated, quite frankly, into the payments ecosystem uh, through Visa and other payments networks. So, so for the first time, I think that a lot of the confusions coming out of the ecosystem and people can focus on, uh, on commerce and the consumer and the merchant experience. What does this mean, Maha, for the mobile companies that you invest in? It means very little at this point because most of the transactions are going through the Apple Store or Android stores. And at, and at that point, they're not using physical payment methods like a, an Apple Pay or a Samsung Pay would be using. At the end of the day, though, these payment methods that the uh, hardware manufacturers are trying to put out, it's fantastic. The consumer adoption is what everybody's waiting for. Right. If you look at Apple Pay as a standalone product, it has not been successful. And maybe adding to the ecosystem like Samsung is doing will help. I'm skeptical. How do you point. respond to that, Jim, that Apple Pay hasn't been that successful? Look, I know a lot of people who have who have iPhones and Apple Watches and they just don't use Apple Pay. Yeah, well, I think it comes back to what I said. The, the, to, the, to this point in time, it's been very confusing, and especially now, uh, even in the Apple Pay sense, where they've got a great product, they control the whole stack, the operating system, the software, the application. The challenge has been the acceptance, and again, I think with Samsung Pay, you'll see that breakdown. Uh, NFC terminals are rolling out across the country, and so as consumers get the ability to use these experiences more, I mean, wearables are coming this year. Uh, I really do think the behaviors will change, but, but these things do take time. All right, this is Jim McCarthy. Thanks so much for joining us, as well as strategy analytics, Neil Mostyn. Uh, Maha, you're sticking with me. Maha Ibrahim, Kane and Partners. Well, Tesla shares are getting a boost today. The electric car maker filing to raise half a billion dollars by selling 2.1 million shares. CEO Elon Musk says the money will be used to expand the company's retail operations, charging network and energy storage business, as well as help out help roll out new models. The Tesla SUV is expected to come out next month. Musk already is one of the largest shareholders, will be one of the buyers as well. Coming up, candy crushed shares slip off the back of King Digital's latest results. We'll have all the details you need to know next. And NASA is looking for a few good smartwatch designers. We'll explain.
Now to a story we are watching. Niantic Labs, an internal Google startup, has officially become Google's first post-alphabet spin-off announcing it'll function as its own independent company. Niantic Labs is the creator of the popular augmented mobile reality game, Ingress, which has been downloaded over 12 million times. They said the move will help them align more closely with investors in the entertainment arena. King Digital shares are slumping despite beating on earnings. The problem, a weaker forecast and a dip in monthly active users. Still with me here to discuss Maha Ibrahim of Canaan Partners, who's also on the board of the game maker Kabam. And joining on the phone, IDC Gaming Research Director Lewis Ward. All right, Lewis, so what's the problem? King Digital shares way down right now. Right. Well, I do think it, it was slightly disappointing in the sense that, uh, you know, some of their key franchises really didn't shine this quarter. Uh, I think that was consistent with what we'd seen over the past few years with the slipping of Candy Crush, Candy Crush Saga. And it isn't the case that some of the newer titles have really come up and pick up, picked up that slack. You know, Maha, as someone who's worked closely with a company like Kabam, you know, how difficult is it to come out with another hit? I mean, Ca Candy Crush Saga has been around for three years now. It's been around for a long time, and like a television show, <laughs> eventually it it you know it, it reaches its end point, and that certainly is not where Candy Crush is right now. It has years and years of legs. Really, but in terms of new MAUs coming on board, that's going to be their struggle because one could argue that they have saturated the market at this point. Lewis, are there any games, new games from King Digital standing out? Other, you know, you've got all the sagas, Pet Rescue Saga, then there's this Paradise Bay. I mean, do any of these look like they could be a hit? Well, I think it's very early days for Paradise Bay, but I think that it's important. Uh, you know, I'm a fan of diversification in pretty much any company, so, um, you know, it, the fact that uh, Candy Crush Saga is going down isn't necessarily a bad, a bad sign as long as the other games pick up the slack. Paradise Bay basically debuted in the preceding quarter. It is ranked about 35th as of today uh, in terms of the grossing charts on iOS, which I consider a good first uh, step. The question will be is over the coming months, does Paradise Bay, with, with the resource management uh, game mechanic, move up a lot? Because that, to me, that would be a very good sign for King that they've branched out into other successful uh, game mechanics other than Match 3. It seems like, Maha, a lot of these mobile game makers are, are, are struggling with, with coming up with these hits. We've seen it with Zynga. Where is the opportunity, opportunity for, for an innovation in mobile gaming? So it's important to separate the types of mobile game companies. On the one hand, there's King and Zynga, which are heavily dependent on what we call casual games. And those are games with very, very low average revenue per user, but tens of millions of people going into the game. And once those companies start losing audience, they lose revenue very, very quickly. On the other hand, there's the strategy game companies like a Supercell or Kabam or Machine Zone, where the average revenue per user is very, very high, so they don't, they don't require tens of millions of players to be in the game. And if you do get tens of millions of players in the game, you win big, like those companies have done. In the case of Zynga or, or King, it is a leaky bucket. They need to continue to innovate, continue to make sure that those games have a much longer life than they do, and then add the games on top of them. Now, Lewis, when you were here last, we spoke about mid-core games, which is console or PC quality games that you can play on mobile. How's King doing there? Right, well, they're really not there yet. So um, I think resource management is a much more complex type of game than is a match three puzzle game. So in that sense, um, you know, I think there's room for some more sophistication. And if it really, you know, gets people um, sucked in and addicted to it, like Candy Crush Saga has done, but in a more complex way, there's the possibility of longer legs. What we've seen in games like Clash of Clans, which has been top grossing game for over a year now, um, you know, is there's a lot of customization and there's a lot of um, ability to upgrade within the game. So that, that higher level of sophistication and multiplayer is really important over the long term. And King really has not jumped on fully the multiplayer bandwagon, which is, to my mind, the crucial mechanic which gives games longer legs moving forward, including mobile games. Uh, all right, Lewis Ward, Gaming uh, Research Director at IDC. Thanks so much, Maha Ibrahim. You're sticking with us. Uh, King Digital still way down after hours.
Well, NASA is calling all smartwatch app designers. The space agency posted a contest to Freelancer.com requesting a smartwatch app that could be used by astronauts in space. The app needs to include an agenda view of the crew's timeline and agenda, color-coded alerts and warnings, communication status between the International Space Station and Earth, and timers for astronauts to manage procedures and activities. Contestant participants don't actually have to make the app for the Samsung Gear 2, just a visual presentation of the user experience. A reward of $1,500 will be given to the winning design. That sounds a little low. Whatever. Okay, still ahead, Tinder swipes left on its CEO. After only five months on the job, we'll discuss why the dating app is bringing back co-founder Sean Rad. And who are the mystery fiber optic cord cutters? The FBI gets involved after a series of internet infrastructure attacks in the Bay Area. the Daily Bite, one number that tells a whole lot, and today's number is $10,000. That's how much AT&T is offering as a bounty for information about more than a dozen mystery fiber optic cable cuts in the Bay Area. The FBI is investigating, but so far they have no motive, no suspects, no witnesses. The fiber optic cables process everything from flight reservations to 911 calls, but experts say they're more vulnerable to attack than other critical infrastructure. In this case, it looks like the culprit just lifted a manhole lid, climbed in, and snipped the cables. Luckily, internet traffic can be rerouted quickly, and FCC data says these kinds of malicious incidents are extremely rare. Well, another day, another co-founder returns as CEO. In the past year alone, co-founders of Twitter, Reddit, and Zynga have all returned to run the companies they help create. And today, we can add Tinder co-founder Sean Rad to that list. Rad is reclaiming the company's top spot following the swift resignation of Chris Payne, a former Microsoft and eBay exec who was hired just five months ago. In a press release, board member and benchmark partner Matt Kohler said, it's only been a few months, but there was mutual agreement here that it was not the right long-term fit. And given Tinder's rapid growth trajectory, both Christopher and the board thought prompt action was best for everyone. Joining me now to discuss Tinder's executive shuffle, Alex Baringa, who covers Tinder for Bloomberg News, Maha Ibrahim of Canaan Partners still with me, and Alex, we're hearing that this was not related to the tweet storm and the whole Vanity Fair incident. It's a little difficult to believe, but okay. Why are they doing this? <laughs> That's right. The company's saying it's not related to what we were talking about yesterday regarding Tinder, but they say they're bringing Sean in to basically help uh, accelerate after Chris wasn't really a great fit. So you have to remember, Tinder's in a position where they're trying to monetize. They introduced this premium package that users can pay for in February, and they're trying to build out this product. Well, Sean Rad was a product guy, and he was one of the original founders to begin with, really focusing on developing something that users will love. So when you think about kind of where the company is in its life cycle, it seems like that could be behind the decision as to why bring Rad back now after they've now split from their, their latest CEO. So let's revisit why he was demoted in the first place. There was a sexual harassment lawsuit targeting uh, the CMO at the time who was no longer at the company. They thought a new CEO would sort of help them move past that, bring in better talent. So Maha, is this the right call? So I love that you're asking an old married lady to go. <laughs> I'm not married lady too. Company. Okay. <laughs> so we were investors in Match. Uh, we're investors in Zeus right now, and I will tell you that the dating landscape has transformed incredibly over the last 20 years from what I'm told and what I see. Yes. And I, I would Me not too. know. Not um, firsthand. But it has <laughs> moved all mobile. It has moved online. And Tinder and Zeus have been at the forefront of that. When you have management team changes like has happened so quickly at Tinder, it could have been simply it was not a fit. If I'm on the board of that company and I feel like the management team that I've put in place very quickly is not working, the best thing I can do is call a spade a spade and just move on. Right. You know, 
Anderson Horowitz has been very big on founder CEOs. Mm -hmm. uh, ben Horowitz writing, founding CEOs naturally take a long view of their companies. The company is their life's work. Their emotional commitment exceeds their equity stake. But when there are complicating factors like this, yes. is it the right call? I don't know about this specific one. I completely agree with Ben and what he's been saying, and I try to make that the case in all of my companies. When you extricate a founder from a company, like was done in Tinder or wherever, the heart of the company can sometimes go away. Right. So you want to keep some emotional connection and some um, thrust and energy into the company that comes from that founding base. At the same time that the heart may have changed, the valuation, as far as we know, has been going up and up and up, but nobody knows just how much Tinder is worth. Alex, what do you know? Uh, so Tinder, again, is part of this match group, which is still part of IAC. Analyst Peggett Barclay says t uh, match group is worth $5.7 the whole group, while Tinder alone could be up to $2 billion worth of that. We might get a little more clarity into that after IAC um, IPOs part of this match group, which it said it plans to do for less than 20% of the company later this year. So that might give us a little bit of a clue. We might see some more granularity there moving forward with what Tinder actually means. One interesting thing, though, to your point about adult supervision, when they did um, move Sean Rad out of that position, that was some of the rationale earlier. Now you also have Greg Blatt coming in as of today to take over as an executive chairman position in Tinder as well. Greg Blatt, as you know, is the, the chairman of the Match Group. He's the former CEO of IAC, and he also was the CEO of Match.com before, uh, back a few years ago. So all of these factors kind of coming in to maybe assure that the company has a little bit more guidance going forward. So, so there will be adult supervision. Maha, I mean, I, as an investor in Match, I mean, do you know how much Tinder is worth? I mean, do, I mean I've heard it could be worth more than Match. It is worth what people will pay. That's right. the first thing I'll say. But Match brings the revenue, Tinder brings the traffic. The excitement is going to be when Match and Tinder can get that, that machine working so that the traffic that Together. Tinder is bringing can actually be monetized. Okay. But we still don't know, Alex, who sent the tweets? Who sent the <laughs> tweets? Did Chris send the tweets? I know that it came from Tinder. <laughs> we don't know. I know that it came from Tinder. They haven't backtracked that at all. But it did make for some good uh, nighttime tweet Twitter uh, watching yes. last night. Or a yes. couple nights ago, that's for sure. <laughs> Hex's biggest unsolved mystery, in addition to who's going to be CEO of Twitter. Okay, Alex Perinka of Bloomberg News. Maha Ibrahim, thanks Thank so much you. Uh, for Never joining us. Never tweet in anger. That, <laughs> uh, that does it for today. Thanks so much for joining us.